Right, good morning, good morning everyone. Welcome back to the EduChat series. Today is the 27th of December 2020. So uh, uh, first of all, just like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. So how has your Christmas been? Uh, and as always, uh, for those of you who are watching right now, please comment down below which country you are coming from. Uh, and uh, Hopefully we are able to have another uh, awesome session for today. And I'm sure for today's session, many of you will be anticipating the sharing session by all of the speakers that will be joining us today. And of course, you know, uh, they, they always say that uh, the best things are always safe for the last. And uh, I guess for this EduChat series, probably it would be the final EduChat series for the year 2020. So uh, I guess it's going to be one of the most awesome one of all. Right. So uh, without further ado, I, I just like to uh, give a little bit of introduction on uh, who will be joining us on this uh, EduChat series for today. So uh, for today, we have the team uh, all the way from uh, USA, from uh, Berkeley, California. And uh, the team uh, is representing a company called Magnitude.io, Magnitude.io. And I guess uh, most of you have saw the video that we have actually shared uh, yesterday uh, in terms of what are the programs and all of the exciting activities that they have been working on uh, in the USA, right? Uh, and uh, a little bit about Magnitude.io. So Magnitude.io is basically uh, a 21st century STEM education company. So they uh, mainly uh, they are focusing on assisting the next generation of scientists and engineers with project-based learning experiences. And many of you have been asking me, right? So what is this uh, uh, company all about? Uh, are they really sending experiments to space? Uh, what is it all about? So we will we will be uh, ask, we'll be answering all of that questions, including a very detailed explanation on what is it about, right? So for those of you teachers as well as parents, uh, please do stay tuned on the entire program because by the end of the session, they will actually be sharing with you one of the very interesting activities that you yourself, uh, as a school representative, as a school teacher and, as, and a parent, you can have your students as well as your children to participate in this internationally acclaimed uh, program uh, that is going to be very, very exciting as well. All right. So uh, I, I'm looking at the comments over here. Good morning, uh, as always, and all of those. Uh, please do comment down below which country you're from so that we can know uh, where we are discussing. Also, by the end of the day, uh, please do, if you have any questions for our speakers, uh, please do comment down on the session below uh, so that we can have a conversation between us and uh, the speakers that we are having today. All right. So without further ado, uh, I would like to bring up uh, one by one. There was, there's going to be four of the speakers that will be sharing with us today, all from Magnitude IO team. So I'm just going to be bringing them up uh, one by one, uh, sort of like summoning the Avengers. <laughs> all right. So from here, uh, we have uh, Mr. Ted Tagami. So he is the CEO and founder of Magnitude IO. So uh, without further ado, I would like to bring Ted Tagami up on stage. Good morning, Ted. Ted Tagami. Good evening, Jay. <laughs> Good evening. So uh, what time is it over there, Ted? It's, it's a little after 6.30 in the evening. All right. It's about 6.30 in the evening. So uh, how has everything been? And uh, are you still working today uh, on the second day of Christmas? I'm taking a little easy. Uh, you know, after Christmas and before the new year, it's an awfully good time to reflect, especially with the crazy year we've had. Um, and uh, I'm joined here a little later on. You're going to meet my co-founder, Tony, and uh, our colleagues, one in New York, Michael Wilkinson, another one in Florida, Lori Waters. And uh, we really are trying to connect the entire planet with our uh, experiments in space. Right. Awesome. And I, I guess we'll be having more of that uh, shortly in a while by Tony, as well as all the other members as well. And speaking of Tony, uh, let's bring up Tony So, uh, and he's the COO and the founder uh, co-founder as well of uh, Magnitude.io. Hello, Tony. Hello, everyone. This is Tony So. <laughs> Hi, Tony. So, uh, Tony, so uh, would you be able to tell us uh, where are you uh, dropping in from? Are you from uh, the, the same location as Ted as well? Well, um, I live in uh, Oakland, uh, California. Um, I, I think most of you know where San Francisco is. Oakland is uh, just uh, across the bay from San Francisco. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful area. It's a little bit warmer. It doesn't uh, get too hot, and it doesn't get too cold. And um, <coughs> our office is in uh, Berkeley, California, uh, which is only about um, maybe I don't know ten miles uh, from where I live. And uh, Ted lives in uh, Albany, and he's a lot closer to the uh, office. And um, our office uh, in Berkeley is uh, really close to uh, UC Berkeley. Um, it's uh, one of the, the most uh, famous uh, university in um, California. Right, uh, as well as uh, from there, uh, thank you again for joining us, Tony. We have been speaking a lot, even before the session. Uh, glad that you brought the entire team from Magnitude IO to join us on uh, the EduChat series for today. All right, so uh, next up, uh, we actually have uh, uh, Lori Waters, so she's actually the director of communication of uh, magnitude.io. So I'm just going to bring up Lori over here. Hello, Lori. He hello. <laughs> Greetings from uh, Orlando, Florida. All right. So from Orlando, Florida. And Lori, uh, how has everything been? Uh, and um, uh, what, what are you guys uh, actually happening over there in, uh, in Orlando? Well, you know, there's a, a lot to see and do in Florida, and we are the sunshine state, but um, I think Michael, um, being in New York, sent us some of the cold weather, so uh, lots of people indoors other than a few uh, families walking around to see the Christmas lights in the neighborhood. Uh, Low-key Christmas for many uh, people here in the U.S. this year, but still a sense of community um that you know we'll all get through this so it's uh it's been a very nice christmas here right so uh, i guess it has been a, an awesome christmas every year in orlando especially with disneyland around the corner uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes disney has is is down down the street not too far with their uh, all their attractions so wow. uh, and i can see rocket launches from my backyard which is pretty exciting when they go off from cape canaveral so wow. there have been quite a few of those the last several months, especially with SpaceX. So we, we have a variety of attractions. I know. We, we are really, really jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds awesome from our side as well. Probably uh, if you are able to share some pictures later on with the space <laughs> launch and everything, that'll be awesome as well. All right. And, and uh, finally, we actually have uh, Mr. Michael Wilkinson. So he's the director of education of uh, magnitude.io. So uh, to complete the puzzle, hello, Michael Wilkinson. Hi, Jay. Great to be here. All right. So Michael, uh, so uh, you're currently based uh, uh, in which location currently? I'm in, I'm in New York, where uh, we just went from minus 60 to, I think we were plus six today. So, uh, yeah, and we had about a uh, foot and a half of snow. So about wow. <laughs> so about 40, 40 centimeters of snow last week. So um, wow. yeah, a little right. different climate than everybody else here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So has it always been like that uh, for the past many years? Um, so winter time, yeah, it although the last few winters uh, have been pretty mild, um, we haven't had much significant snowfall. So, uh, you know, this was the first snow day in a long time, the last, last Thursday that, that, that we've had. So, but winters are always, are always uh, chilly. <laughs> All right, so, so with that, uh, I guess we have the entire squad uh, together with us today. So today uh, we'll be discussing with the team over here on the topic of uh, your class in space orbit. Yes, you did not hear it uh, wrongly. It's called your classroom in space orbit. And literally, uh, we'll be discussing on how the team actually pulled off one of, one of the most amazing things that I've ever heard, uh, that you actually brought a uh, classroom and experiments all the way to space and orbit. So uh, with that, I guess, uh, let's start off the conversation uh, together with uh, Ted, if you are able to give us uh, some uh, introduction and probably some background uh, in terms of what Magnitude IO is and what do you actually do uh, as a whole? Absolutely, well, thank you, Jay. It's great to have only part of our team here. We actually have quite a number of educators that work with us in different parts around the world, from Africa and Europe and Asia. Um, and maybe we have an educator in Malaysia that'd like to join our squad. So if you listen to this and you seem excited about putting stuff in space, you should come, come talk to Michael, Lori, Tony, or myself. But All right. Maggie, we've been around since 2013, and it's uh, kind of the brainchild of me and Tony, um, kind of working up some crazy schemes of doing stuff in space. One thing led to another, and through the good fortune and some great people that we met, our first experiment went to space. 
uh, in of 2017 on a SpaceX rocket, uh, SpaceX 10, the CRS resupply mission, number 10. Um, and what's fascinating to, uh, to me um, is walking through this process. Um, our objective and the, our namesake magnitude is really what we're trying to do in, in the space of education. We want to increase reach to extraordinary experiences, real authentic experiences, right on the very edge of discovery. Um, it, in terms of orders of magnitude of reach. So having three or four or five students aboard an admission is exciting. It's interesting. They've kind of reached the pinnacle. But what if we can bring 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 students to, to join us in the experiment in space? That's what we're doing with the ExoLab. In addition to this idea of magnitude, thinking of things of orders of 10, we are looking to reduce cost orders of magnitude. So if you wanted to right now say, I want to go to space, I want to run an experiment on the International Space Station, it's probably going to take you, if you're really fortunate, you have all the right connections, maybe 18 months, a little more work, 24 to 36 months, just to get it up there at a cost US of $100,000 or more. Um, we've dramatically reduced that through scale. So by running a single experiment in orbit and reaching out to schools around the world, and, and we have some homeschoolers, also that have joined us right from their kitchen tables, we can dramatically reduce that cost from hundreds of thousands down to under $1,000. In fact, our ExoLab, which our team will share with you, is only $399 US. And we have these little kits really designed just for students that kind of was born out of the pandemic. And again, I think our team will share a little bit more detail what that is. But you can actually have this experiment at home and you can work alongside us in this experiment we will launch in February of next year aboard a resupply mission to the space station. And that kit's just $10 US. So you can get to space for $10. And I think a lot of schools might take a field trip, get on a bus and they go across town to the museum or the, the zoo or what have you. We're gonna take you to space. And that experiment runs for multiple weeks and there's some lead up right up to it as well. So we're really excited about being able to offer that to you. One thing I'll mention just so you get a concept of what, what this is, on the highway there, on the, uh, you probably see a, a, a 18 wheel uh, uh, truck with a big container on the back, or you see the ships pulling into port in these big 40 foot containers. Or if they're rail cars uh, where you are, then you'll see these on the back of cars as they travel across the country. That is called intermodal transportation. And I can take a container and fill it up in China, and I can end up in, in, in Chile or in South Africa or somewhere in Germany uh, in just a few weeks time for just a couple thousand dollars. This idea of intermodal transportation basically has been developed for space. And through our connections and just good fortune, Tony and I and our team at Magtube has been able to take this idea of intermodal transportation and run your student experiments in space. So our eighth one's coming up. And instead of a 40 foot container, we're looking at something that is essentially a 10 centimeter cube or variations of it. So this is intermodal transportation for space, 10 centimeters on a side, weighing up no more than 1.3 kilograms. Our unit going up in February is actually going to be four times the size of 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters and 10 centimeters deep. And we'll be growing some plants in there. And we have this little interesting relationship these particular plants have with the bacterium. Actually, it's a good kind of bacteria. Uh, and we're seeing what they actually do in microgravity to consider both life beyond Earth. Maybe we want to do something on Mars. You guys want to help us build a garden on Mars? Let's do it. And probably more importantly for us is thinking about what we can do to ensure that we're rejuvenating our soils here on earth to make sure everyone has food and water right now. Water, there's water scarcity. In fact, the Chicago Board of Trade just this month of December started trading water futures like oil, like pork bellies. Water is a, is a rare commodity now at this point, apparently. So can we get plants to grow in water that may not be pure, maybe a little brackish water, some salts in it and what have you. So all of these things we're trying to discover and understand and our team will share more with you about that. Right, and and Ted, uh, I would just like to find out uh, on the origin stories of uh, magnitude.io. So how did you came up with the idea? Uh, of what was it like uh, when, when you actually got started? Oh with my magnitude. goodness, you know, for the one story we'll tell you today, there are uh, dozens of stories that probably should not be told. Right. <laughs> as far as finding the right thing to do, um, right. I love to experiment and, and imagine what's possible. And with the team, they help say, well, you know, this is viable. 
this is what works. And so we've done many different things uh, that are related to science and the technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And if we can engage uh, learners, really of any age, right? Authentic research, get them involved where they're asking questions and their mind is alight with curious ideas. That's when we know we've got an exciting investigation. So whether it was the idea of maybe doing something like a real live stream archeological dig, which you have yet to do, or underwater robots or uh, autonomous drones, we settled on atmospheric research and we fly high powered rockets and high altitude balloons. And really what takes a lot of work and, and Loria and Michael will share with you a little bit more, this ExoLab, this project that takes uh, an experiment on earth here, prepares it for a mission in orbit and then runs it in a microgravity environment for a period of time. Awesome. All right. So uh, I guess with, with that, I, I guess you have prepared a very comprehensive uh, sharing session. Uh, yeah, and I everyone. hope uh, if, yeah. they, if people have questions, by all means, fire them away. But why don't we turn it over to, um, I don't know, just the next slide will probably give me a, a clue on who we should bring up uh, next to talk about what we've got going on. Yeah. There we go. So, Tony, why don't you tell us a little about the schedule we've got coming up. Mission number eight is scheduled to go up in February 20th. And Malaysia still has a chance to join us. All right. Uh, sure. Um, now, um, you know, um, sending a sending a um, uh, cargo to space, um, uh, there was always a delay, uh, especially for uh, rocket launches. And I'm sure uh, you you often hear about it, but uh, it is uh, uh, really happening uh, quite often. And um, 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 uh, in the beginning, we thought uh, uh, we had the uh, schedule for the beginning of uh, February, and um, uh, we just learned that about two weeks ago it got delayed to uh, the twenty. Is it the twenty second or twenty twentieth? Twenty twenty second. Twentieth, and it will be up on twenty second. Yeah. Right, and uh, it it will be uh, going up uh, to the International Space Station as um, uh, one of uh, their uh, resupply mission. And uh, what that does is that um, uh, they take all this uh, cargo along with um, all the different types of uh, research experiment, and uh, they load it into the um, uh, into into SpaceX or whatever rocket uh, flight that we have uh, commissioned with. Uh, they bring it uh, all the way up uh, to to the International Space Station. It takes about uh, two days to get there. Is that correct? about two days uh, before they actually dock, right? Sometimes it can be a little bit uh, sooner. Um, and uh, once they get there, they unload, they, um, um, uh, the astronaut unload everything, they uh, install it into our, um, uh, our locker. Now, uh, what you're seeing on the deck uh, uh, right there, um, uh, in, the, in the red area is uh, where we are going to be running the experiment on the station. And uh, uh, for the entire time uh, coming up uh, to the um, uh, to the experiment, uh, we are, we have been running a lot of uh, ground trials. For example, uh, what kind of uh, legumes uh, we want to uh, send to space? Uh, how how do we uh, interact um, um, uh, the route um, with the different types of agar, uh, different uh, different types of a uh, formula. Um, uh, Laurie and Michael will uh, go a little bit uh, further into that. So uh, we actually do that uh, along with um, uh, uh, teacher and students uh, from around the country uh, to come up with a protocol on uh, what uh, what to bring up and uh, how to. Uh, how to get started with all the experiment. And then we recommend all the teachers uh, from around the world who, who is uh, joining us to do exactly the same thing. And uh, we, we hope uh, every student um, and uh, schools around the world will start around about the same time. And um, um, for the last uh, few years, we have uh, built this uh, one platform um, uh, it's uh, designed uh, to uh, to pair your experiment with the one on station live at almost real time. So starting starting your experiment um, around the same time is ideal, but you don't have to. Uh, you can uh, start 
your experiment, uh, pairing it uh, with the one on station, uh, one week later, one month later is perfectly fine. It is always uh, pairing it uh, to, the, to the same day of the experiment. So you right. don't lose anything during the entire experiment. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will share uh, how that works um, a little bit uh, later. And, and um, you know, Laurie and Michael can uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we are going to do uh, when we get the experiment back from the station. All right, All right. So, um, so just to iterate from here, uh, I've seen some of the videos and, and uh, a web page from Magnitude IO. So essentially is that if I'm a teacher, I have an experiment, I'll be given an experiment. And what's gonna happen is that you're gonna be uh, taking that experiment, put it on a spaceship from Earth, send it out directly onto space, right? Put it on the ISS, the International Space Station, and then put a camera there and allow all of the teachers and the students to watch it and observe it here on Earth. Uh, is that correct uh, on my on my description of it? That That is absolutely mm -hmm. right. Is right? Um, actually, why don't I, do you mind if I share a video of uh, how the astronaut uh, install our laboratory into our locker on the station. Sure, that would be amazing. All right. Okay. So that you know, for the first time when I I was uh, listening about this concept from Tony, uh, it's something like <laughs> something out of this world that that you can actually take an experiment, uh, put it onto space, uh, uh, going through on the rocket. Uh, I just hope that uh, you know I, I would be able to replace. Uh, the place of the experiment instead of the experiment going to space. <laughs> it's still a little expensive. The price is coming down. I only think yeah. it's about twenty-five million now. Yeah, probably I'm, I'm a little bit overweight, uh, and yeah, but uh, but, but do you know what? Uh, chocolate via the the volume metric, or or is it more of the weight of of the both? Uh, yeah. both, both are good consideration. Mass is the is a big issue. Um, uh, your modern rocket, even a fission rocket, takes about 95% of the, the mass of the rocket is used just to get it into orbit. Right. Often it's five, maybe six or 7% of the mass is used to deliver the cargo and the, the primary product. Okay. So, all right. So, so we are looking at Drew Morgan, a U.S. astronaut, fixing. Uh, would, would you be able to share with us uh, what, what's actually happening over here? A little commentary. Sure. Um, so what we have right there, this is a locker. Uh, and this uh, express rack has a number of experiments in it. You'll see this cube that I shared with you earlier. Uh, I think this is a 2U, so it's probably 20 centimeters long. Um, and uh, there it is. It's You'll see it on the data card. Oops. Looks like it disappeared. Here we go. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and you can see that it says five, six, seven, eight. Uh, those are the the uh, slots for the for the the locker rack. Um, our car, our uh, experiment basically gets put on a um, data card, like you see there, and gets slotted and then boots up. And uh, our astronauts touch us just twice in order to get our cost the most reasonable. We want a minimum engagement time with the astronauts. If they were to bill us, they don't bill us, but if they were, it would be $35,000 an hour. So uh, <laughs> you wanna make sure that they, uh, wow. they, they set you up, you're up and right. operational, and when you're ready to come home, they put you in yeah. a nice bag and get you all nice and cozy to get a ride home. Yeah, $35,000 is almost like a salary of LeBron James, uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually really cool that uh, we got to chat with Serena on, um, after she came back to earth and uh she was like what was in that box she because she didn't get to see it she was the 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 astronauts are really excited about the experiments and love to know what they're about but a lot of these they just all they're doing is they're plug and play um and so for she it was you know it was really exciting for her to be able to see what what she'd actually done help help contribute to wow okay so 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 we are looking in, in uh, so so all of the experiments are, are probably uh, in, in a compartment and then they will be slotted in from there and I guess that that's going to be a twenty four hour surveillance camera that will send in uh, pictures and visuals of the experiment down to Earth as well. Uh, there's a number of uh, of sensors that we collect information about the environment. 
So uh, in addition to the microgravity, and I think Lori's gonna talk a little bit about the tropisms, the different things that can affect a living organism, but we wanna measure the gases, right? What's the gases, what's the gas behavior like up there? We want to measure the temperature, how warm or cool is it, uh, and the relative humidity. If we can measure ozone and carbon dioxide, we want to measure these as well to see what's happening to the plant in these environments. And of course, as you mentioned, Jay, the image. So we capture an image once an hour. And all this data can come down through our cloud uh, here at the mothership in Berkeley to uh, the various schools around the world so they can see their experiments growing. Maybe it's in their classroom or a library or a science center or museum um, and what's happening in space. Now, one thing we didn't do, Tony, I don't know, you have an ExoLab there with you at the home office? No, I don't. Um, I've, I, got, I've got one, let me grab it here. Here's one right here. <laughs> and so I talked about the uh, the unit in space. So Jay, I don't know if you can go. Uh, let me, here, let me unshare my screen first. There we go. So here's that one U and you can see our lab uh, in at, on earth is about two of those. In fact, what you saw uh, the astronauts loading up was basically an aluminum box that was about 20 centimeters long. But this is the system that's designed for classrooms here on Earth. So while this experiment's running on Earth, we've got the sister experiment in orbit. And that's what's happening on February 20th, as Tony shared with us. And it's got various instruments on it. So it's measuring carbon dioxide here. Little pinhole here measures temperature and humidity. Little light sensor. Uh, there's that uh, wide angle. Where's my get good lighting here? I got Okay, there you go. Wide angle camera capturing image once an hour. These sensors capture image uh, uh, data on an average every 12 minutes and upload it. So you get five data points an hour. And this LED array uh, can be adjusted for the intensity of the light, uh, the duration or the photo period, and even the wavelength can be adjusted. So what would your plant do under say a blue light or maybe a red light um, during the different stages of growth? Is one light preferred over the other? Why is that so? These are some of the questions that we have about our plants uh, as we grow them uh, uh, in space as well as on Earth. Uh, and so that's the Exolab. That's the one that I mentioned is just under 400 bucks. Uh, so instead of 40,000 or 80,000, whatever, you can get a lab that connects to the space station. And uh, I, I don't know, Tony, you haven't worked out the, um, the uh, import export here with Malaysia yet, but Jay, we can kind of figure something out with you. My guess is if we want anyone to join us, we'll need to figure that out not much later than the middle of January. I mean, that would be the absolute latest because we'd want to make sure we got it to you guys and did some training and you were part of this whole kind of system. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, and, and I guess from there, uh, what, what sort of uh, main experiments uh, have you been conducting uh, for the past uh, years or the, for the past expedition. So in total, how many expeditions has been conducted uh, ever since the launch of Magnitude.io? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so we've done seven. And we, uh, when we first came up with the concept of, of the ExoLab, this device that can run experiments in space, there are many different things we wanted to be able to do. Uh, think about like microfluidics or crystallography or looking of bugs like entomology uh, but we started with plants and we started with the model organism called the rabidopsis and what we realized especially dealing with super smart people that really knew their stuff and space on top of that like astrobotany that you got to stay focused if you really want to be able to deliver a product that means something and so we've had right. seven expeditions to the space station and our eighth is coming up and then why don't i actually let's uh, reveal a little bit and talk about what is it we're actually doing up there right so right. um, I think, Michael, there's a couple slides there that you can share, uh, or was it Lori? I forget which the order was. Yeah, Lori's sharing them. Share, um, <laughs> the state of things. Yeah, as I apologize. Look, I might have, I might have uh, you know, uh, uh, well, stirred up a bit on, on your flow of presentation. No, that's fine. Yeah. Why don't you jump to the slides? Yeah, that's good. So, mm -hmm. um, I, and I saw one of the questions about how do you engage? This is the thing that I think is most important about what we do. This is... 100% student engagement. Your students, you as teachers, you are co-investigators in this research. Um, good science has to have control trials. Um, we want to be testing out a variety of different variables um, and, and know what the plants are going to do under the ideal circumstances here on Earth before we fly them in orbit. So there's this ongoing work that, that um, 
provides an opportunity for your students to ask all kinds of questions about, in this case, the, the, the model organism we're using, our, our clover, red clover, Trifolium pretense. Um, and what we're doing in this whole, in the science of this whole uh, series of investigations, so we're looking at specifically the interaction of the, uh, back, the soil bacteria, rhizobium, with the leguminous plants, uh, because they are a critical part of, of the ecosystem and how it functions. Um, and those bacteria are able to take the, the um, inert free nitrogen in the atmosphere and convert it into ammonia, which then can be converted into the nitrates and nitrites that um, plants use as, as their food. And the most important thing about that is the nitrogen compounds are what make all of us living beings. That's part of the building blocks of DNA. So this is really one of the most fundamental parts of life. Um, and if we're going to be able to, to increase our, our productivity here on Earth with this ever-growing population and bring back land that, that we've depleted um, through less sustainable means of, of agriculture, let alone you know, thinking about venturing further out into space, we've got to be able to provide uh, food that's high in nutrition and also it, we can produce it in a sustainable way. So the core of this is the legumes and this becomes the point where we could actually uh, rebuild or build new soils um, through this interaction with the bacteria and the, and the legumes. Um, and as, as the viewers may know, you know, there's a wide range of legumes uh, from uh, shrubs and trees to clover and soybeans and um, all kinds of, of uh, uh, legumes that, that we use as human food, high in protein, high in lots of other nutrients that um, many are, of which are water soluble, so they're hard to sustain on orbit um, and, and for, a, for a long period of time. Um, and, and so this, this critical uh, uh, point of life is really where we bring the students in and no matter what age the students are, there's a point at which they can engage in this. Everyone can make observations that are meaningful. And that's why we connect everyone to our platform. Everyone's looking at both whatever they're doing in their classroom or their home with what's happening on orbit. And I can't see, you know, everything that's going to happen. I'm, I'm going to miss something. I'm the only researcher who's looking at this. But having these thousands of eyeballs on the experiment will notice things, ask new questions that, that very like, you know, I didn't think of, or my team didn't think of, but they're, they're really important things for us to be exploring. Um, so that's, you know, at the bottom of this is involving teachers and students in real authentic uh, research that has meaningful applications to our future. And, you know, the excitement of being able to do this in microgravity um, and being an authentic participant um, everything that you, uh, that you observe is part of our database and, uh, it, it, hopefully we'll, we'll move toward, uh, being able to publish, uh, some of this work and all of our participants are, uh, co-investigators. So you actually, you know, I, I tell my, my own fourth grade students, these nine, 10 year olds, you could be a published author before you get out of elementary school folks. <laughs> so, which right. is very exciting to them think about, wow, I could be in a scientific, uh, journal. So. Wow, and this is the this is the really cool thing. So I actually grew up in Iowa. I didn't I haven't always lived in in New York. All my adult life, I've lived in New York. But um, in in Iowa, soybeans and clover and alfalfa um, are really important um, crops, uh, and they're grown on a, an enormous scale. Um, we're talking, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares devoted to this, um, and and Growing up, I knew that there was this system of crop rotation. You couldn't plant corn year after year after year because uh, you would use up the the vital nitrogen in the soil. And so you'd go through rotation where you'd, you'd have a, a year where it was pasture, so it was alfalfa. And then you'd have a, another cash crop year where you were uh, growing soybeans. And then you would grow uh, your corn or, or oats or um, whatever grain crop you were going to grow. Um, and there's this whole communication that happens in the soil between these living organisms. Um, there's an exchange of, of, of different uh, chemical signals that the, the, what starts out as a pathogenic infection, the uh, bacteria literally infect the root hairs of the, the legume seedling. 
And um, when all the conditions are right, there's a series of physiological and biochemical changes that happen between the uh, bacterium and the, the plant where the plant becomes a symbiotic host to the, um, the, the bacterium and encapsulates it uh, because the, the rhizobia does not like oxygen and um, it literally rusts in the, in the ox it, it'll oxidize. And, uh, one of the, and, and so they'll create these cysts, these growths we call no, no, excuse me, nodules. And you can see them on the, the um, inset uh, of this with the, the large image. There's a little potato-like growth on the, on the clover seedlings roots. Inside those are, are colonies of these bacteria and they are converting actively the, the nitrogen into the, the, um, the compounds that the plants can use. In exchange, the plant is feeding those bacteria the sugars, the, the glucose that they produce through photosynthesis. So it's a true uh, even exchange between them. Uh, and in fact, the, the plant will produce, or, uh, through this symbiotic relationship, will, will fix more nitrogen than it consumes. Um, and so that also, you know, it helps enrich the soil along with just fueling that, that plant's growth. Um, and if you cut these, um, these uh, nodules in cross section, you'll actually see a bright pink red color when they get exposed to the oxygen. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's called leg hemoglobin. And it's actually very much like the hemoglobin in our body, blood and iron compounds are the way it's exposed to the oxygen. It rusts turn red instead of the, the greenish color of the the uh, blood is when it's not in, in oxygen. Um, so that's all happening at this small scale that all life depends on. Um, and just the communication, you know, think about these plants are signaling out to the soil. Come on over here, little bacteria. Um, I, can, I can take care of you and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll work out a deal here. We'll anthropomorphism, but in essentially that is what's happening at a biochemical level. And, and so then for students, young students can get this idea of, wow, these two organisms are, are totally inextricably linked to each other's survival and we depend on their being able to survive. So now I've got all these you know, kinds of ecological reasons to be interested in and invested in this work. Um, and then older students can, you know, they can really get into this very sophisticated signaling. Um, there's a tremendous amount of research being done in it now and uh, still you know, a lot to be learned. Um, and we found that there are other plants besides legumes that can do this, but the legumes are the primary uh, source of, of this nitrogen fixation. Right, right. And, and Michael, just one question, right? Yeah. What's, what's the main difference uh, between growing the legumes uh, over in microgravity in comparison uh, to, to growing it in the earth? Uh, what, what are the main differences uh, when you bring it up to an environment, in, in, say, for example, in ISS? That is, I mean, that is the core of this very question, James. Why would we want to, you know, okay, so we send it to space and grow in space, but there's got to be a reason to do that. Um, NASA's going to not let us, they're not going to give us uh, uh, space on the, on the lab to, to, to do this work unless there's a real benefit from doing it in microgravity. There are all kinds of stresses that can inhibit this. So what is happening here is an inflammation reaction. So like if you, if you injure yourself, your body responds, as an immunological response and you get an inflammation and then you'll take some kind of anti-inflammatory to uh, uh, ease that, that inflammation, make it less profound. Well, the plant does the same thing in response to stress. They literally make their own aspirin, salicylic acid, and that inhibits the inflammation that we need to be happening. And so there's, it, we, we have to be able to bring this food with us in space. We're, we've got to fuel our, our, our bodies and our brains to function out there. Um, but we've got all kinds of stresses, the stress of launch. And I, I should probably let um, Lori go into this more deeply. This is, and this is the piece that we've really been exploring in our pre-flight work and the questions that we are asking students. What is the, what's the impact in, the, in these stresses of launch? What about the time, the period that it's going to be in the dark or light once it gets on orbit? So, and Laura, you want to pick up a little bit on, on that work that we've been doing both ourselves and, and bringing the students on board with and what we hope to learn uh, while we're on orbit? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess from here as well, uh, probably I, I would just um, move on with uh, the flow of how you would want to present it. So, uh, yeah, Ted, uh, Tony and Laurie and Michael, uh, you, you can take over from here as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sure. Well, that ties in um, nicely with what Michael was discussing, um, it, these differences between what we're seeing on the ground and what we expect to see in space flight. And the, the big question and the big focus has been on can nodulation happen under that um, stress once the seeds have launched and they're in microgravity, we still have that symbiotic and mutualistic relationship between the plant and the rhizobia. Because even here on Earth in our ground trials, we don't get nodulation 100% of the time. There's um, other factors. Um, if the plants um, are stressed, there's a range of tolerance of which plants can grow and in which even which bacteria can live. So um, if temperatures are too high or too low, um, that can be a factor if um, they sense that there's other parasites uh, in the media or the soils, whether it's a fungus or mold or um, other types of uh, prokaryotes that aren't friendly, then the plants will, will close off that access and not permit anything to come in through that cell wall. And so it'll prevent nodulation. So there's a lot of research still in this area about how these, these plants even work on earth. But now when we put them in flight, um, where we assume that, you know, that they have evolved over time so that the roots grow down and the shoots and the stems and leaves grow up. Um, but it's been fascinating uh, that when we put these clover seeds in the dark for several days, they actually start to grow. And so this gets to the tropisms. And so the red clover are highly sensitive to phototropism. They will start growing at a very rapid rate, seeking light. Um, but it's not always the shoots growing up and the roots growing down. We've had some um, fascinating uh, recent um, uh, ground trials where the roots have grown, grown up and they've curled around or they've curled in circles around the, the edges of the tube. But um, that, that phototropism seems to be a little bit more dominant than the gravitropism. And that's even here on earth. And so it'll be fascinating to see once we get them in orbit, not only is nodulation um, the center of our attention, but I'm very curious now to see what's going to happen with the shoots and the roots. Um, if they're going to mimic the patterns like we've had here um, on earth, or if they're going to do something entirely different. So um, also, we're going to have um, three seeds per tube, um, at least three, uh, so that we can get a total of nine um, in the three across the three tubes. And so, the thigmotropism, in terms of, is three even going to inhibit them um, growing? Because as they uh, release chemicals into the media. Um, there's, they sense each other, which is uh, another thing that we have, have seen here on earth, that if you pack too many into a tube, it, it stunts the growth or causes a stress response and you don't always get nodulation either. So the tropisms are, are definitely a, a key thing that uh, we'll be looking for as we, uh, we put legumes into orbit. And NASA has not done this before. No researchers, have, they've not tried to to achieve nodulation on uh, a legume um, as of yet. And so this is really a demonstration um, project that uh, we're pursuing here to show that, you know, that it can be possible. And um, with some of the uh, opportunities, particularly in the middle and upper school grades, uh, you can really get into the microscopy, um, the study of, of prokaryotes and eukaryotes down to the cellular level um, in studying the, the different um, differences between those, um, using uh, microscopes, um, and even a teacher, if uh, teaching uh, remotely, can set it up as a demo um, if they have access to their microscope to show uh, the, you know, we see all these glorious little diagrams of organelles 
um, on models and in textbooks, but in reality, that's typically not what you're going to see under a microscope. So to give students authentic images of um, showing the, um, the gram staining, um, that pink, that bright pink that shows up when you stain the bacteria from a root nodule, uh, you have confirmation that, that that's what is, is filling that little, little nodule. Uh, also being able to, um, you know, test different types of um, the microorganisms. It's not only the rhizobia that may be in a media or in a soil. We do not even begin to understand yet all the different interrelationships of the microorganisms in our soils and the role that they play um, in, in producing food. So a lot of opportunities um, with students to uh, explore uh, these topics through the platform. Uh, we have ready-made lessons from kindergarten all the way through high school, and uh, more are being added uh, over the next coming weeks as we think of a topic and go, oh, that's interesting. And then we say, well, we've got to add something on there because we need some students to help us investigate this. So it's really an opportunity for students to, to be part of authentic research and to drive, uh, drive the inquiry. And um, in this era of distance learning, we have um, the educators from around the world have turned to using Bitmojis. So through uh, making Bitmoji classrooms, you can really send students on uh, a out of this world scavenger hunt to learn uh, the background about how plants are grown in space. You have the advanced plant habitat is uh, one um, piece of hardware that's in orbit as well as the veggie um, unit that um, uh, in this fall or this spring rather, they're gonna be growing uh, peppers uh, in the advanced plant habitat and the veggie has currently had uh, radishes um, growing in it. So um, at one time it grew the, the beautiful zin zinnia flowers and um, harvested those, but even NASA is still trying to figure out how best to grow plants in space and deal with the fluid dynamics and the nutrients and um, really how these organisms function uh, in the microgravity environment. So um, many different paths that teachers can take uh, to um, really let their students be curious and ask the questions and, and drive the lessons. Mm. Hey, Lori, you're talking about yes. putting plants in space, but you want to share about putting a teacher in space? We kind of did that. It's not really an actual teacher, but <laughs> sure. you that maybe you want to tell that. Sure. So we held um, uh, applications were open uh, in November. We were looking for an astromoji. And in this era of distance learning, we can't send a physical real teacher to space, but we can send his or her bitmoji. And um, teachers from around the world ap applied for this Astromoji uh, mission specialist position. And we reviewed um, many Bitmoji classrooms, many um, uh, essays and as part of the application process. And we selected Lisa Turney of uh, Linwood, Kansas to be our Astromoji. And so her, uh, her uh, astro emoji holding the plant um, look some similar, somewhat similar like mine here on the screen um, will be on our exo lab, and uh, as a as a sticker there representing uh, her school. She's a technology teacher uh, for her elementary school K to five, and she really drives inquiry and builds in uh, science uh, with her her technology lessons. And so she has uh, won uh, that opportunity to be the Astro Emoji for Exolab 8, which is just so exciting. And so we'll have some lessons from her and some videos from her as well uh, that we'll be putting up on the platform. Mm, there you go. Hey, so Tony and Jay, maybe we can actually put a Malaysian astromoji in space. Um, <laughs> we, we wouldn't be able to do it next year. We usually plan a year in advance or longer. 
um, but we're still be just beginning to think about what Exolab 9 is going to do. Obviously, right. we have a lab right in front of us right now, but um, it's space, and so we have to kind of start planning well in advance. If any of you guys are watching and kind of excited or intrigued about what we're doing, you should reach out to Jay or actually, Tony, I think you might have a little form you, you, you've uh, set up for so someone can get some additional information and join us. Yeah, but, yeah, um, definitely. So, yeah, so do share the right? link with us, and probably we'll we'll put on the comment down below. Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen is that uh, probably more will be watching in uh, tomorrow as well, uh, or the later time, so they can actually have a look at it. Uh, I just wanted to find out from here, uh, in total on the programs that you did, right? Uh, what what's the scale of uh, um, a school and teachers that are already participating in this community. I, I see that uh, there's like a huge range of teachers and students that are tuning in on, on this uh, Magnitude IO platform, mm -hmm. uh, including Exolab, uh, as well as the other initiative. Would you be able to share with us uh, who are your main uh, uh, school, uh, the, the school levels, uh, what, what are the school levels and who are the that, ones that, that are- uh, That's very intriguing, Jay. So we start with this, this premise that Laurie and Michael laid out this idea of this relationship between this plant and this bacteria, kind of as a, a number of experiments leading up to this one. Uh, and our engagement really goes anywhere from like pre-K to like postdoc researchers. <laughs> you know, it's like right. uh, our astrobotanist, like uh, there's a, a gentleman, Dr. Richard Barker out of Gilroy Lab in Wisconsin, who's been wonderful in, 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 in engaged in our activities and interests. So they're kind of leading the parade, if you will, and we have everyone that has interest. We have our Exolab set up in libraries, uh, public libraries, and uh, just a regular person coming to come in to check out books or whatever sees the Exolab uh, growing a plant. And there's usually a, in fact, I have my monitor behind me, he's off right now, but usually you'll see a live view of the earth right now. Here's the earth as you're flying over maybe India or, and the imagination of what you start thinking about what the potential is. Quite often in those situations, the librarian will curate fiction and nonfiction work so the students can read and have deeper knowledge or maybe just some enjoying a text like The Martian or what have you, right? Um, and so we really, it's, I think, wholly dependent on who comes to see us. Uh, we've had examples here leading into summer where both Michael, Lori, and a couple of other of our, our elite teachers had these homeschool environments in which the students uh, wanted to learn about this and they weren't in a formal school setting. We're considering that again uh, in, in, in February. If you guys are Great. thinking about pot potentially a homeschool application, we'll have to think about that. Uh, and then quite often there's an engagement at the high school level, you're gonna be directly in like a biology class, right? But we're asking the, or like a chemistry class or a physics class. But we ask them to think about the interdisciplinary nature of our investigation, because anything you're going to do in the future, maybe you're already in the workforce, you, you might uh, have some young children, you're watching this because you're, you're excited about your kids learning something. Uh, and you know, in the workforce, you've got your thing that you do well, and you have to collaborate with others. And so we want the students to think about this across disciplines, which we think is very important. And then it, when you get to like the, the 12 or 14 or 15 years of age, it really is kind of an interdisciplinary approach in the United States. Uh, often you don't have just a physics class or just a biology class. It's usually general science and it goes all the way right. down into the primary schools as well. Um, right. So it, it really covers everything. What's uh, As you get into the uh, uh, older age students and they're doing authentic research, uh, this poster session uh, as an example, Tony, why don't you share a little bit about our platform and how someone could eventually get into something like this, the research that they gather through a live investigation can literally turn into a poster session. Then if it's good enough, we can take that to the ISS Research and Development Conference that happens every year, all right, alongside astronauts and other researchers. So there's opportunities for students, really. Tony? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, uh, we landed the right on that the uh, correct uh, slide. Now, uh, the platform is, um, let's see. Uh, Jay, could you switch over to my screen? Sure. Uh, one more. Right, there you go. Awesome. So this is, um, um, so we have a, a platform that uh, um, uh, 
um, that connects uh, all the teachers and students together and uh, every teacher um, uh, that is uh, 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 that is in the program, uh, they all have their own account and uh, so as uh, all the students. And uh, this uh, platform is uh, where they uh, do all the work, uh, how, um, how they um, make observation to, um, uh, to their experiment in comparison with the one on station. Uh, they log on to the platform uh, they will see a screen like this. And uh, usually on the right hand, uh, on the left hand side are images and the data coming uh, from your classroom um, environment. Uh, because uh, of our laboratory, our, um, um, our ExoLab uh, lab, um, is uh, monitoring the entire, uh, uh, the entire duration of uh, the um, uh, experiment. So uh, you get all the images, you get all the data and compare with the, the, uh, the images and data coming off from the International Space Station. Now, uh, we don't have a experiment uh, running right now. What you are seeing on, the, on my screen is um, uh, the experiment from uh, ExoLab 7. Uh, that's the last one. Now, uh, with this uh, one UI, you are able to, you are able to go back in time to look at your experiment. Let's say, let's say uh, one week ago, uh, you, you missed uh, the class, uh, you were on vacation for two weeks, and uh, you, want, uh, you want to ask uh, your student to uh, give me some uh, observation data. And uh, let's go back in time to December, December first. Uh, what what um, uh, what they are seeing on December first. So uh, as you can as you can see, uh, some some of uh, the growth of uh, the experiment, you can actually um, pinpoint exactly what time and what day it started growing. Um, now for, for the next experiment, uh, we are paying attention to the nodulation in the root. Uh, uh, you can literally um, uh, zoom in enough uh, to see the root uh, structure uh, if they are getting a uh, nodulation. This one is a little bit uh, too uh, murky. Uh, you are not uh, seeing the, the root uh, as well. And uh, we have uh, developed a, a, a new way to um, uh, to position the argon uh, gel so that uh, we are able to see the root a little bit better. Um, now, uh, within the, this platform, uh, because uh, we are collecting that data uh, every single day um, and uh, every 12 minutes, uh, we are providing all the data uh, for the student uh, to see. Now, data science is uh, very important. Um, uh, uh, that uh, is a very important learning process. Uh, even though in the future, if they don't um, uh, become a scientist or engineer, uh, if they go into finance or advertising or marketing, they have to look at data all day long. So getting a good practice uh, starting now uh, in the middle school or high school, uh, uh, it will go a long way. Now, for example, like this, uh, they can uh, remove a certain sets of uh, data and uh, they can uh, make comparison uh, to the data. Um, actually, let's look at uh, humidity. So by looking, uh, actually this here too. So by looking at the, the data, uh, they should be asking a lot of questions. Uh, why are we seeing all these uh, peaks and valleys? Um, and, 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 uh, and also, you know, we make all the data available for them to download. Um, uh, they will be downloading raw data and the teachers, uh, they can um, assign a um, uh, special assignment for them to, okay, let's learn how to import all this uh, data into Google Sheets or Excel Sheets and make their own chart. Um, 
Now, at the end of the year, uh, when they make their own report, uh, whatever summary they, that they have um, um, uh, come up with, um, uh, it is more valuable uh, using data to support what, uh, what, they, what their findings are. This is, if I could just add, Tony, this is the, the synergy between um, the, the visual images and the data. You know, the, the, the graphs are a, a, a visual story of what's happening with the data. Um, and students will notice something, and you might have noticed something in, in one of those graphs. And with that, with, our, with our, our, our time machine technology there, you can actually go back and pinpoint that time and see what was going on with the plants in this case at that moment in time what possibly triggered that sudden change or what did that what was the effect of that sudden change all kinds of questions and then is then the students can uh, go deeper in that investigate try to replicate those, those that that th situation um and and find out what impact that has on a larger scale Right. It's almost like it's almost like a 24 hour surveillance camera. So, yeah. so they can fast forward and, and they can go back in a specific point of time. And you, it, and you never that. really know, you know, you don't always know, OK, what data do I need to collect? And to have children collecting everything and trying to weed through everything. It's, it's too much. But if, if they're asking the questions, then they know exactly which data they have to go back and look for. Uh, and they can make more focused observations to, to uh, uh, support the, their investigation in that particular phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So having, um, uh, having a system like this uh, is uh, very useful, especially when you're running a, uh, a research experiment 250 miles away from, uh, from us. Uh, you, you want to be able to see the data. You want to be able to see what's happening with your experiment in space uh, in almost real time. So you can uh, make you know, um, so you can make decision uh, if you want to uh, change uh, the color of light or do something uh, to bring down the temperature. Um, so uh, being able to see that uh, is uh, very important. Now, what I have uh, on the screen is um, all the uh, lessons uh, that we have um, uh, uh, put together. Um, the team, uh, Lori and uh, Michael, uh, they work with, um, I think, eight other uh, um, principal investigators, and uh, because they are the, uh, they are part of uh, the experiment, um, so they are really well equipped uh, to write up uh, the lessons that um, uh, that uh, they would love to see the student to go through um, uh, with it. Now, all these um, uh, lessons are really designed to make life easier for the teachers. We understand uh, teachers in the classroom, uh, they just have a lot to do. And uh, we don't want to uh, create more work for them. And um, all these uh, lessons, they can uh, click on it and uh, they can see all the uh, uh, data, um, all the lessons, um, um, and all the different sections, how they are aligned to uh, different standards. Um, there might be uh, sections that, uh, uh, that is uh, designed for the teachers to, um, uh, to think about. You might want to ask this kind of question in the classroom um, uh, to interact with the kids. Um, and, and, and also we understand you know, every teachers, they like to, um, uh, to, you know, they, they all have uh, their own way of uh, teaching. So we have um, created the ability for them to uh, clone the lessons and they can uh, modify the lessons uh, in the way uh, that they want to teach it. And uh, for example, um, uh, you can uh, clone the les lessons and uh, translate the entire lessons uh, from English to Spanish, Malaysian, um, or any other language. Uh, so that uh, you can uh, really use it um, uh, for your for your class. Right. Any questions? Yeah, uh, and I guess uh, <laughs> yeah, just just one question over here. I guess when you were mentioning two hundred fifty miles, that's vertically uh, right, right. <laughs> vertical distance. Seventy thousand five hundred miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Ninety-three yeah. minutes around the Earth. So. 
yeah, yeah. Right. You know, so, it, it, it might seem very normal for you to to just peak. Uh, oh, it's just 250 miles away to to Earth. It, it's still a, another dimension of, of of putting our brains around. Oh, 250 miles in vertical uh, up. Yeah, uh, upwards. exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and and that's a tough thing too. When you talk about how much energy is required to get into orbit, uh, that's that velocity across the ground in order to achieve that low Earth orbit, not, you know, not escape velocity, just getting into LEO. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like 19 out of 20 uh, parts of that rocket are designed just to propel it up there. Right. You know, 5% of it is actual payload. Um, and that's a, that's a big go 25 times the speed of sound. Yeah. yeah. That's so that's, really and that, that's only going to get you an orbit of, of the planet. You can't, you still can't escape the, the, uh, the planet's clutches at that point. So, right. Uh, uh, just, just one question over here. So, uh, would you be able to walk us through on the journey uh, from a, a teacher or an admin uh, who were to participate on this program, right? So, mm -hmm. as soon as they they sign up, and uh, what what's going to happen next? Uh, yes. Uh, so why, why don't I cover that? And I'll try to be succinct. One thing, first of all, Jay, I'd like to invite you with your network to think about what we can do to leverage the resources that you have to really make it a compelling and engaging exercise and experience for anyone that's interested in Malaysia or even beyond uh, the region there in Southeast Asia. So um, we're kind of getting near the end of uh, uh, the time in which we're gonna take more uh, um, uh, visitors to our experiment. Um, right now we've got, uh, we're filling orders. Uh, we're expecting to close it at the end of the year. This came up and uh, kind of talking with Tony, we're thinking we can probably run it maybe till about mid-January in terms of taking additional uh, tickets to ride. Uh, but the most important thing is we know that they're going to come join us, right? And so we know it's a maybe it's a, a number of students under independent study, or maybe it's a school district or school, maybe it's an after-school program, or you know, um, learning more about what you do, Jay. I think would be interesting to think about what we can do to kind of leverage that dynamic. But then it's about professional development. You're getting the equipment sent to you from California. Uh, it's going to take a couple weeks to get there. What's the unboxing look like? How do you set up to the platform? How do you navigate through the lesson plans? Uh, and all those things, uh, well, we can set up a session for, for the teachers to do that. Um, we've got a rocket launch schedule of February 20th. And so maybe you've got your gear coming in the, at the end of January or, or first week of February. Um, you have a few weeks before you actually have that rocket going up with our experiment on it. Let's learn a little bit about rocketry. Let's learn a little bit about the International Space Station. The fact it's been in orbit for 20 years, longer than most students have been on this planet. Um, let's talk about the different countries that were involved to make the space station. And then what I get excited about, uh, not just our experiment, because super excited about Mission 8, but um, thinking about the Artemis generation. Now, Jay, I guess you guys probably know about this, and we want to in the United States here. We want to put a woman on the moon, right? If you look back at 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 at, uh, um, at uh, uh, the, the Apollo work. Uh, Apollo's sister, according to mythology, was uh, um, was Artemis. She's actually the goddess of the moon. Perfect name for this project. So, right. 2024 is what they're shooting for. Can we actually get uh, a woman on the, or back to the moon, woman and men alike? Um, and then the, the journey to Mars. So over the next number of uh, decades, we're expecting to see someone physically on that surface of, of the red planet. Perhaps it's one of the students watching this right now thinking about inspiration, right? right? And so before we even got that launch, we have all these things we could consider. But now here's that plant. These actually just these seeds. We have to make sure they germinate once they get to orbit. We don't want them to start growing early. Right. And so we're working through the engineering. There's some challenges for our students if they can figure it out. We've got our ideas. But once it's up there, we're going to watch that plant grow for a period of weeks. It's going to be on station really, I think, till the end of May, maybe even early June, because we're getting a ride on a Cygnus uh, um, capsule. And that turns into a garbage scout. It actually takes a bunch of uh, garbage from the space station. It burns up in the atmosphere on the, on the way home. We don't want to get a ride home on that one. So we're going to hang around and for a few months on station, we're going to get a ride home on the SpaceX Dragon. They'll put us uh, in a little bag. They'll send us home. And I think Lori alluded to this a little bit. Once we get back down here on Earth, let's see what actually happened to this plant. We're going to do some microscopy. 
and look down at the at the cellular level to see if there are any things that we can notice in terms of the structure of the walls and what have you. Maybe the leaves will look different or the shoots or the roots. Let's see what that nodulation, is there anything unique about that nodulation that happened? And then, you know, crossing fingers here, crossing my toes as well. If that specimen actually comes back in really good shape, we might even try to do some epigenetic research, thinking about the gene expression changes, how that might have happened. Um, it's kind of expensive to do that, and we want to make sure our specimen looks great. Uh, but that that would pretty much take a, a, anyone engaged in this, whether it's a teacher, a parent, a student, from uh, end of January, really through uh, the end of June. Uh, but here's the cool part. That's the mission Exolab 8. And our team right now, and maybe there's a couple of teachers that are excited about wanting to do this in Malaysia, we're getting ready to begin thinking about plans for Exolab 9. And we'll really probably kick that off in January internally and then make it more open and public once we're operational on station with Exolab 8. So if you have ideas, kind of taking our theme of, of finding nutrients for our soils here on Earth, uh, uh, making sure that everyone has food, that uh, zero hunger here on the Earth, the United Nations has a wonderful sustainable development goal with zero hunger. Uh, we want to kind of align with that. So something very terrestrial, very uh, notable, I guess, especially, Tony, you like to talk about this, what is the soil like where you live? Is it different than the soil in Kenya? Is it different than that cold soil there with Mr. Wilkinson in New York, right? Or down there in Orlando, Florida with Lori. So, you know, what does the environment around the earth look like? And can we make life better here? But also, can we grow something on Mars? Wow. And I'll share one thing with the, with the audience here. This is my, my, little, my little notes. I don't know, Jay, I'm going to ask you, put you on the spot. Can you guess what this is? 7 March to 22nd of April, 2023. Um, is that your, what? <laughs> uh, is that your space adventure uh, bucket list? <laughs> <laughs> it is. This is a train schedule, everyone. There's something called a Holman transfer. Holman transfer. And that is where it's the most efficient path between two heavenly bodies. In this case, between Earth and Mars. That window opens every 26 months, and it's open for about six months. You will save the most amount of fuel, which means you can send more cargo during those windows. And so for us, we're everything in our head is thinking in 26-month cycles. So in 52 months, might we have something going to Mars? Probably take one more after that. But our goal is actually to work with folks like at NASA, scientists, engineers are thinking about plant uh, bot botany, uh, astrobotany. And not just growing things here in, in microgravity, but thinking about what we might be able to do on the surface of the moon or maybe even uh, on the surface of Mars. Sustainability, big issue here on Earth, but super cool if we can get some of the students with our team here to devise something that would actually grow on a different world. Wow, right. how cool would it be? Right. Yeah, and, and uh, Ted uh, and Tony as well, and maybe Michael and Laurie, uh, you'll be able to answer this uh, in, in terms of you were mentioning that um, Exolab uh, has been uh, on for the past seven to eight missions, right? So as a teacher were to join in, are they able to get access to experiments and data from the previous experiments as well? Or is it going to just be uh, Exolab 8 uh, mm -hmm. tuning in live on, on this experiment? Tony, why don't you speak to that? Uh Actually, go ahead, Michael. Um, <laughs> I think I That's one of the early. really cool things about the, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a math and science educator, and, and you, you can participate in all the missions right. from the very first one because all, all that data is archived on our system. Mm -hmm. You can set up your exolab to repeat any of those experiments, and that's where the real science comes in. Okay, you saw one thing, or maybe you missed that one. Run it again. Does the same thing happen? You are, are still able to add to that database, um, and you know there's an opportunity to discover all kinds of new things. So yeah, if you, you join an X, X Lab Eight, you've got seven prior missions that you can be running at the same time uh, okay. if, if you choose. Yeah, we grew some tasty plants too. We had a mizuna, we yep. had wasabi. If you like sushi, you have your wasabi, right? Right. Uh, but the first uh, joy, amaranth. Joy. Yeah, amaranth. Uh, and so uh, most of the, the first missions were with a model organism, just kind of like the fruit fly is a, is a, or, or, the, or the common mouse uh, for uh, research. 
there is a plant called the Rabidopsis, uh, and that's used because its genome's already been mapped, and you want to kind of look at proteins and what have you. That's a great plant. So we started with that. We went to these, and the, we ran off of just a quick list of some other plants that we had flown. And now with this, uh, the bacteria in the legumes, the last two missions, and this one coming up here in February, have been focused around this symbiotic relationship. First with the bacteria, then it was cowpea, right, Michael, number seven? Yeah. Uh, right. And now we've got the, the the red clover. And maybe you guys can help us figure out what we want to do for mission nine. Um, and Tony, right, as we broke for uh, the end of last year, it was kind of a wacky year. Last school year, we created something called the Guminat Challenge because we didn't really know what we wanted to fly. So we asked everyone, well, what do you want to fly? And give us a reason why. We had a lot of fun with that. And we had some great guests that joined us, uh, kind of very similar to your show here, Jay. Um, and I, I think that would be a lot of fun to think about how we might connect the work that you're doing in Malaysia with our work in different parts of the world. It'd be really cool to see that. Right, exactly. Uh, I guess from, from Ted as well, uh, for the ExoLab and probably Magnitude IO as a whole, uh, how, how big of a community of teachers and students are already in, in this platform? Maybe if you could share a little bit of sure, background. Sure. On yeah, we have uh, several hundred of the ExoLabs out there. Uh, contact and engagement depends on how it's being used. In a whole sc homeschool environment, it might be just a couple students with their parents. Uh, in a school, if it's in a library, we might have 1,500 students working with the ExoLab. So it's really kind of varied. But we have a couple hundred ExoLabs that are out uh, there around the world. As I've, I think we've mentioned uh, in Kenya, South Africa, uh, Romania, and Germany, um, Canada, uh, uh, in Japan. Got Gil Cawthorn there in Japan. And a lot of it's here domestically in the United States. We don't have a, a, a pin on the map yet in Malaysia. So whether it's Kuala Lumpur or somewhere else, well, shall we put a pin on the map? What, what can we do about right. that? Right, right. And yeah, that definitely uh, hope that we are able to do that. Uh, I was just wondering to uh, look at into the the ratio of it. Say, for example, one account, right? How how big of a class can uh, can can the teachers uh, uh, pull in the, the students? Uh, say, for example, an, an account uh, with ExoLab 8, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how many students can participate at one go in, in an account or in an access to? Uh, well, I, I see. Yeah. I think I see what you're saying. So our platform, mm -hmm. we can handle 100,000 students. So that's not right. an issue, right? For an individual teacher, that's probably pretty hard to do. Yeah. Usually in typical class size, a couple dozen students. If the, if the teacher has multiple periods, they might have 150 students. All that works through our platform and you can manage your students there very easily. The way we've set this up, that ExoLab device I shared, this guy right here, is the hardware that the educator uses and the students look at this and they compare this system here on earth with what's going in space. And this is uh, just under $400 US. Uh, the kits is basically a ticket for each student to go to space. And the kits have uh, this little agar powder Tony had mentioned in which you mix it up with some hot water and that's gonna be the medium which the plant grows in. We have a little inoculum uh, powder that has the rhizobia bacteria in it. Uh, if we're trying to get bacteria to Malaysia, we're probably gonna have to find a local source, gonna be my guess. It's the good kind of bacteria, but people hear bacteria and they freak out. Uh, and we have our red clover, organic uh, non-GMO clover seeds that come along in the kit as well little pipette uh, and some gloves for a clean workspace and oh, a magnifying glass uh, for just investigations. Um, and I think, you know, it's in the United States, everyone's so hip on like getting the latest tech, but something like a magnifying glass, especially for some students that don't understand the principles of light, you know, you got a little magnification going on. So it's a helpful tool and it's really moderate, right? In terms of expense. And so this little uh, ticket to ride and this little kit that goes for each student is just $10 US. So, um, you know, you can outfit your your classroom, standard classroom of 30 students for, I guess, under $800. Uh, and if you have a larger one, that's just another $10 per student. If you have a big region or, Jay, you're trying to do something on a, a larger scale, you should probably talk to Tony. And we have to figure out logistically if we can actually pull it off. It's getting a little tight in the window here. But we could probably collaborate with you and do some kind of um, bulk pricing to get uh, more teach students engaged, more teachers engaged. We're trying to, the best we can, continue to reduce our price to increase our reach. Uh, and we think it's really attractively priced right now, but you know, if we can make it lower, we will. Uh, and that just means we've got more students coming aboard. So um, if you're interested, I guess they're gonna be contacting you directly 
J uh, in Malaysia, but uh, so I think we have a form that they can fill out as well. Um, so I don't know how we want to coordinate that. I'll leave it up to you and Toby. But I'm yeah, excited to have you guys join us for sure. Yeah, Jay, I just uh, share two links uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, if you could uh, share with the uh, audience, uh, that would be awesome. One of them is um, um, uh, is uh, all the uh, items and the details of um, uh, how uh, 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 each you no know, package is um, um, can be purchased. Uh, the Exolab, uh, the uh, the number of kits, the teacher kits, uh, and also there is a link uh, to um, uh, uh, for for teachers to uh, fill it out uh, if they if they really want to do it and uh, uh, they have a hard time um, um, uh, using uh, using a credit card to make purchases uh, directly on on the page. Uh, they can use a form to contact us and uh, let us know how many school uh, uh, that they are signing up for, uh, how many students, and uh, we can make it work for them. Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, Ted and Tony and Michael and Laurie as well, uh, I, I guess I was thinking uh, in, in a way that uh, in Malaysia, we, we could actually organize sort of like a, a competition in between schools uh, with regards to the findings of uh, Exolab number eight or, or in the future as well. So, so the main idea is to, from that observation of uh, Exolab eight, uh, what could the uh, students derive from that and probably to, to have a sort of like a, com uh, a competition uh, amongst them to, to really explain to us their findings and, and their, their uh, insights uh, towards the entire experience as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess that would be something mm -hmm. uh, very well, we'd interesting. We'd love to judge something like that, Jay. In fact, I see one of your prior guests, Diana, uh, just put a little something, Phillips from Canada, yeah. put something in the chat there. Hi, Diana. Um, mm -hmm. And we can have uh, Diana and our other uh, uh, co-investigators uh, be judges for a program like that. Um, maybe we can even get someone from NASA to weigh in on findings there. Uh, right, right. They help us determine what Exolab 9 would be through their investigations. Yeah. Holy right. crap. And that communication so, aspect of the science is, is so important. Um, just the, trying to organize your thoughts and, and communicating that to, to others about what you learned and, and building on each other's research. That is so much a part of the process. So yeah, that'd be fabulous to have, have students doing that. Yeah, yeah. This, this wouldn't be your average science fair project. <laughs> it's definitely your authentic research. And um, when I ended the year last year with my biology students and we created those posters and just as a summary of everything that they had learned um, from how to read and understand uh, high level scientific peer reviewed research articles and then interpreting data, um, looking at diagrams and the life cycle of these plants um, and having all of that culminate into kind of a poster or a project that then communicate it out. And I think more needs to be done with students to give them platforms and opportunities to discuss their findings and their ideas. Um, because in every one of these projects, you you, you do what you've set out to do, but then you have 10 more questions that come up along the way. So what are they thinking? And those are the kinds of things that we would love to hear from students. Yeah. Right. And, and one more thing I wanted to add is that um, uh, when, when they are done with uh, every experiment, we hand out um, a certificate of uh, uh, completion. So every single student will get one as long as uh, they really completed the, the entire program, right? And um, I, I think competition is, uh, is important, it's, uh, it's exciting, but we want to have um, more students doing it uh, so that um, they can become a, a better competitor on the next one, right? <laughs> And uh, I just I was just looking one of your uh, posts in Magnitude IO is that one of the school in Kentucky they actually went to the STLP state finals with their Exolab and Kenstat uh, uh, program. Uh, would you be able to share a little bit more about it on how they actually utilize uh, Exolab as a whole in participating in a competition like this? Uh, what what was the the method of them? Uh, uh, bringing forth the, the findings and, and how did they actually utilize the entire experience on, on education uh, in a state level competition? Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, it was um, Michael who um, who worked with uh, that group of uh, students in, in uh, Kentucky. Um, maybe Michael uh, can um, uh, talk a little bit uh, more about um, how the entire thing came together and and uh, uh, how, what the students have learned and uh, going to the to the state finals. Sure. So um, this is an academy of um, high school students who are, are doing early college work. So they're simultaneously high school and undergraduate uh, students. And um, so they've, they've divided up into a variety of different disciplines. And I work with a small group of students who are interested in astrobotany. Uh, and they help us in the early stages of this of, of, of Flight 8 in down selecting what, uh, what legume candidate uh, had the best chances of uh, reaching the point of nodulation in microgravity. Uh, so we met uh, every week or two just to share findings. They were going through the same research, the same development, um, at finding out what kinds of questions each of us was, was working with. They actually uh, presented the, to the plant group during this recent ISS uh, R&D conference. We had a virtual conference this autumn. And so they were, they were one of the presenters sharing their research. They're also looking um, directly to address the, the issues of um, uh, food nutrition and um, the, the UN goal for uh, ending world hunger. So a nice collaboration with that. And then they had other students who were more on the engineering and coding track who were looking to develop ways of um, continuing to monitor the, the plants and um, uh, could they distribute even more of these exolab type experiments to, to their community. Um, so it was a really exciting program where they they were very much empowered to uh, explore and engage. So it was a great it was a great group of people to work with. Right. Yeah. And and I was looking at the uh, some of the, the core topics that uh, was listed over there. So so that's science, technology, and arts as well. Uh, would, yeah. would you be able to share with us uh, how, how does art actually plays a part in the uh, the experiment over here? How how do they actually relate art into the education sector as well? Well, all of this is a human endeavor, and art and artistic expression is very much a, a human attribute, as much as inquiry is. Um, and it's a it's a means of communicating. Um, the you know the the as a math person, the math is poetic and beautiful, but uh, there are different emotions that can get triggered, and and you really have to have your entire uh, brain stimulated in terms of the learning process and bringing all students into the realm. And you know those those graphs are great if if you can can read a you know a a, a standard um, uh, graph like that, but it's a whole lot more engaging have somebody who's gone into data visualization and made that really pretty. So it's just, it sucks you in and it's much more effective in communicating. Um, and, and some of these things like, you know, as Lori mentioned, we can't see down at a certain level, but our brains can envision it. And how can you communicate that? So we're very visual learners as, as the human animal. And so people who are, you know, the graphic artists who are able to uh, uh, represent what these ideas might mean, uh, what they might look like, and how we can think about them, and the, the, the ways in which they're, they're um, connected to each other. Just part of the whole creative uh, process. Um, I mean, even, we, even the posters I have behind yeah, me, these right. were, you know, are, they're artist renditions from NASA of, you know, teach on Mars, explore the moon, Mars explorers wanted, you know, we want you. And so, so How long do we write about artist, going to space right? before we ever did, right? You know, the, yeah. the whole genre of science fiction and uh, so much of it has actually started to come to be. Um, and, uh, you know, the, that the artist can envision that far before the engineer can realize it. Um, well, and even the poster that I was shared during the um, the slide presentation, my student Ruby, um, there was a very small um, graphic of it within her poster, but she created this beautiful watercolor of the the diagram showing the life cycle and the changes that take place over time. And she spent so much time on that piece of art and it truly was art. I mean, it was beautiful. Um, diagram, but, you know, labeled still, getting all that vocabulary in there. Uh, but the, just the, 
the care that she put into it, she understood what she was doing and she was expressing her learning in a very artistic way. And, you know, we need to do that with students is give them opportunities to show what they know. Um, and it's not always an essay. Um, give them chances to create infographics, to create um, graphic art design, to create mission patches, um, and, and to build in not just, you know, the research and the data part, but like Michael said, of, of adding the art to it as well. Because that's where, our, you know, some kids' brains are wired in that very visual way. And so Exolab 8 just has it, has it all for kids who, who are those analytical, the data, the engineering types, the, um, the more um, scientific inquiry types, the hands-on learners, as well as the artistic students with the visual aspects too. And personally, I use watercolor uh, in my uh, uh, observational drawings when I'm documenting the, the growth of the plants. And what I've found over the years is, is in using the watercolor or colored pencil, I have made so many observations about the pigmentation of plants that I might not have noticed if I was just writing down numbers um, or, or even writing a descriptive observation. And that opens up this whole new set of questions is plants are communicating. Those changes in pigment mean something. And so then correlating that to the, the, the quantitative data um, is, a, is you know, so much a part of what we do. So it, the arts are, have to be part of the, the equation here. Um, and right now we're communicating with each other. We're, we're, you know, we have to express our ideas. We have to develop a vocabulary, whether it's a visual vocabulary, a numeric vocabulary, a, a linguistic one. It, it all comes to be. And sometimes, you know, kinesthetic learners, dancers, athletes, that is a way of communicating what's happening and, and visualizing how the, the, the systems work within um, the different organisms. Right, and and I guess uh, I think that there's a lot of face-to-face uh, -face workshop as well as well as online workshop uh, that 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 has been conducted during COVID and pre-COVID as well. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to share with us uh, how how did, uh, how what does the student say and the teachers what what did they say about the entire experience of it? How did they uh, uh, enjoy the entire journey? Would you be able to share a little bit more of what uh, the actual participants actually say about the program? For, for my students, it's what kept them and myself all sane through the spring and, and uh, keeps us all connected. Uh, you know, and I've heard over and over again. I've, I have students who are two or three years down the road. They're still growing their plants at home um, and because they've gotten so uh, excited about this. Um, but, but the students have got their plant experiments at home. When we're in person, we have the work that's at school. Uh, but we're still able to share our observations. Everybody's doing their research and fully invested in it. So it's it really, uh, you know, in the worst of circumstances, it's a, it's a great uh, piece of curriculum. And families were also getting involved in it. Yeah. It wasn't just the students is what I saw in the spring, even with the older students, the high school students that I taught, uh, you know, the the parents were chiming in and they wanted to see what was happening with the plant. And I had one student come on one day and he told me, you know, very sadly that his plant had died. And um, unfortunately his mom had killed this plant. And you know, here I am the teacher and I'm saying, no, come on, take responsibility. You were in high school, you killed your plant. And his mom got on the Google Meet camera and she's like, no, I'm really sorry. It was my fault, I killed the plant. <laughs> <laughs> so the parents and, and siblings were getting involved in it too. And they're just so excited. I even, um, my daughter stays in touch with some of my former students. And she just told me the other, the other day, she said, um, my friend wants to know about the plants because it's still growing. <laughs> so it was, it was fun that, you know, the, they're, they kept going with it. And so it's something that really brings um, the, the curiosity out in the kids and an activity to do. It's not just everything that's on the computer. It's right in front of them, something that changes from day to day and month to month. And they're really trying hard to keep them alive. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and real science isn't one and done. It's reiterative. Right. So to, to stay with something, for a long period of time um, is is 
when lear- the real learning happens, those deep questions, you know, my plant died. Okay. Why did it die? What were the conditions that you had it in? What, how can we change your, t- was, it, was it your technique? Was it the environment? You know, what are the factors that actually contributed to that? They help them understand that's not a failure. That's data. Right. Now, what can we right. do with that data? How can we make use of that? Because we don't want our plants dying on orbit or once we're out there on Mars, we need these plants to survive. So we've got to figure out what are all the things, uh, Laura, you, we were working through this whole thing about uh, delaying germination and one issue part. Well, I found 20 more ways that we won't ter- delay germination. That's important. Um, that's, that's right. Real learning. That's right. And that, right. and those students need to understand that too, is that as scientists in the scientific community, they collaborate. And yeah. as we have developed these protocols uh, to fly the clover, no one's ever done this before. So we are killing a lot of clover in this process <laughs> to figure out how not to do it so that we can get to the way, the best way to do it so that it has the best chance to achieve our flight goal. And right. so um, that's the exciting part is that, you know, it's really opening our own eyes as teachers. How many times do we, you know, get professional development right on, on teaching pedagogy, but the science part is there for the teachers too, to really um, dig in and explore their own practice um, as scientists. Mm -hmm. And so it's exciting for both the teachers and the students. Yeah, that's a good point, Lori. Jay, one thing I guess to to answer your question in terms of the experiences, you know, you heard from Michael and Lori as educators. One thing that I think Tony can probably reinforce this as well. One thing that was kind of an emergent behavior that I wasn't necessarily trying to do with, with the Exalab project it actually brought communities together. Uh, the pandemic is really strained relationships and and there's a fatigue about all of that. Um, if we, in the United States, and I'm not sure how you guys have managed it uh, there in Malaysia, but um, you have your, your parents wanting the kids in school, other parents wanting the kids out of school, have administrators wanting one or the other, uh, and the teacher kind of getting torn in between trying to manage their own families and everything that's going on on top of that. Um, and the Exolab, as it kind of emerged uh, through April, May, June, was this community that kind of came together where it was a, a chance, a reprieve from the, the madness, if you will, and for us to think about something that was kind of really literally beyond us in orbit there um, and thinking about the potential, like after all this is over, you know, what's the world going to be like? You know, what can we do now? So we're not preoccupied with, is it coming to get me? Is it coming to my neighborhood? You know, um, and for, I think it was really a sense of, uh, of community that uh, Exolab kind of developed right then and there. We had flown missions prior to this, but it didn't really have that gelling happen. And now we've got really folks from around the world. I can't wait to see some of your, um, teachers and students and parents join us from Malaysia. I'm going to be really excited when that happens in the, in the coming weeks or day. It's going to be really right. exciting to see that. Right, right. And, and, and I guess, you know, not trying to go into the Martha Stewart uh, uh, perspective. Um, so, so everyone, all of the kids will get a kit uh, here on, or on Earth, uh, which is the same exact kit that will be sent to the ISS as well, right? Almost. And then, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it, you can say it's essentially doing the same thing, but right. flight hardware, a little different than our ground hardware, for sure. Right. Because uh, right. you got vibration and other stuff like that. And NASA's yeah. super stringent about things like sound. Right. They can't make, those fans can't make a certain level of noise or you won't, can't fly them. Toxicology right. and other things like that. We can investigate that with the parents, with the teachers and students as well. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and students across the world, uh, after receiving that ExoLab, they will be uh, continuing on the plantation process uh, here on Earth as well. So there, there would be a comparison between different countries and different climates as well, right? So yeah, exactly. from, the, from the Martha Stewart's perspective, is there how, how, <laughs> how, how easy is it to maintain uh, the, the plant uh, in their school or in their home when they're using that kit? Or would you be able to share with us on that? I can do it. That's what, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's really it's, easy, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Lori, and Michael, you want to well, they, they, you know, The clover, that's one of the reasons they end up as, as our model organism is because it 
can deal with some of these stresses in ways that some of the larger legumes can't, and also in a very small space. So it doesn't take, it doesn't require a lot of resources. Um, but it, it doesn't have to perform the same, Jay. It's like, so what kind of light are you using? What is the temperature of the humidity? Again, that's all important data, and that gives us more information about what are the ideal um, parameters for, for successful growth and just how much of a tolerance do these organisms have um, for, the, for the environmental variation. Um, you know, we're going to have to, we have to create a, 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 an environment on, on the moon or Mars for, for our, our, our Mars garden, our lunar garden. How narrow are our constraints? Because that, you know, the, the more narrow those constraints are, the more difficult uh, it's going to be to achieve success. If this plant can tolerate a wider range of conditions, um, you know, we've got a, we're much more suited uh, uh, for successful growth. And, and, like, just, and another, we've seen this everywhere. So there are, you know, it's a good start to begin with. And clover germinates very quickly too. Yeah. And so students are able to see them immediate changes. Uh, in some cases, we have seen nodulation happen in seven, eight, nine days. So that's pretty exciting when a student is able to identify that um, and, you know, that first detection of a nodule that quickly. Now, the yeah. average, um, you know, can be up there depending on your temperature range and and such, um, maybe 18 days or up in the above 20 days even. So um, the media may make a difference. Um, Michael mentioned uh, Mars or the moon. I've been growing some red clover in a lunar and Martian simulants. And to even look at the two of those and compare um, how the clover grows in those two simulated uh, regoliths, they're different. They And thankfully both of them did grow, um, but there are differences. Um, they do tend to like the lunar a little bit better. And so it'd be interesting, you know, to dig into that of why, why is that? Um, but the Martian one, they're a deeper green color um, compared to the lighter green of the lunar. So it opens up a whole nother range of exploration. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, comparing your soils from around the world. Uh, what are the uh, nutrients that are within our soils? I can tell you here in Florida, we've got plenty of sandy soils with pretty much no nutrients. Right. So, um, you know, I, you're, we can uh, do those kinds of comparisons too and connect uh, classes from around the world so that they can compare um, different growing conditions. And even classes within and different, different grades and subjects because now we're looking, at, we're looking at, at, at geology, we're looking at chemistry, we're looking at physics, not just biology. Um, and and mm -hmm. all of that has to, to come together um, to, to understand the whole picture. Yeah, and, and the kit uh, that that the participants and the students uh, brought home, uh, the data will also be, be sent to Magnitude IO uh, to be compared uh, by other students as well. Right? Yes, yeah. Okay. And that's, we can, you know, we need lots, of, for authentic science, we need lots of replicates. Um, and so that's, that's so important for, and, and they don't have to do all those replicates themselves. They're able to pull from the entire community and, and see what other people are, are learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess, Michael, you were saying about, you know, six inches of uh, snow right now over in uh, New York. You, you know, in Malaysia, there's only two weather conditions. Uh, that's only a bright, hot sunshine and uh, pouring rain. So right. that's the only two weather. Uh, so so we, are, we are just right on, on the middle uh, line of on Earth. So, so uh, it's interesting to see how different countries react to the same uh, plant and the same uh, environment uh, that that is being brought in as well, right? Yeah, no, and, and, mm -hmm. and what are the soils like? What is, what's the texture of them? What is the, uh, you can get into the chemical analysis of it. Um, and how does that vary from my soil that's frozen rock hard right now that you know, I couldn't plant a seed outdoors if I wanted to. Um, right. So everything, you know, I'm trying to simulate some of your conditions, not, not quite the monsoon level, but is your equatorial sound different than my, my I'm at 42 degrees north, so you know that's a huge difference. Um, I've got, I'm getting a lot fewer photons um, per square right. centimeter than you are. So, right, right. 
And, and uh, was there sort of like a data that, uh, you know, in comparison with the hundreds of uh, plants that are being planted uh, across the world, uh, which of the plants are, are experiencing the, the highest amount of growth or, or the, the longest amount of uh, uh, growth in the, the plants? Uh, exactly. do, do you have like a competition between that as well? We could. Uh, I guess yeah. we really kind of that, that competitive nature. I think it's really important uh, that uh, there's a reason why we see competition. You, you you strive to be the best. But one thing that we found domestically here in the United States was for the early learners, especially in communities that are underrepresented in the sciences and engineering, uh, just having them participate. And so I think there's two ways to approach any problem. One is a competitive approach and the other one is collaboration. If we look at some of the largest challenges facing our planet today, well past my lifetime, maybe as these uh, children grow up and have families of their own, they're gonna be facing some very dire circumstances. And it's gonna take really brilliant minds, right? The, uh, in, in the sciences and in engineering practice to, to solve these. Uh, and so that's really kind of what we wanna be able to do. So that equity piece, getting everyone involved and engaged to hearing maybe they have more of an artistic view and they come up with a, a, a new musical score has nothing to do with plants or biology or engineering or science, but we were, uh, we triggered that in, in the student and they've got inspiration from that. Um, and the, these types of opportunities are available. We just want to open the door. Um, and it's up to, I think for students really around the world to be able to walk through that door, understand that they have as much right as anybody else to run these experiments. And for those students really right at the very edge of give me the next coolest thing, and they're at the front of their class and they're ready to go to university and they're only 14 or whatever, um, they can move that to advanced research and we will make a path and open it for them as well. Right. Mm. Back, uh, and, right. And, and for, for those uh, who are watching right now, if you have any questions for the Magnitude IO team, uh, please do comment down below uh, in terms of the projects and, and as well as uh, the details. If you have any questions for that, uh, please do comment down below. And uh, just wanted to find out uh, and to summarize on all of the um, uh, competitions that are available for uh, teachers over in Malaysia and probably in other countries as well to participate. Um, uh, would you be able to, to sort of like break it out? I, I see that there's Excel Lab and then there's Bitmoji. Uh, would you be able to give us uh, some uh, form of description on all of the available activities that are? That Bitmoji are was really more, was more for fun, Jay, uh, more to engage teachers during this period of time. And we decided we were going to find one of them to, and put a sticker on our locker to send it up there. So they were kind of a part of the, the space experiment. But our primary mission is really Exolab 8, this uh, laboratory experiment that launches here on Earth, runs uh, in microgravity for a number of weeks. While that is in orbit, we have sister experiments spread all over the world uh, in schools and classrooms, science you know, uh, centers and museums in which uh, the plant is, plants are also growing with that gravity vector in controlled lighting environments, uh, but ambient temperature and humidity. So if you're in, you know, in um, the Middle East, <laughs> you know, during uh, mid-year, it's going to be a little different than if you're in, uh, say, uh, South America or there in New York. Uh, and so um, that's really kind of our focus. We've got another project coming up. I'll just mention that's going to be fun, an around-the-world balloon launch. We'll launch it from Berkeley, and we're going to try to have the balloon go all the way around the world. Uh, we had one uh, we launched at the end of last year, school year, and went pretty far. It went all the way across the United States. It went over the Atlantic. It went over North Africa, across the Middle East, into Asia, came out on the other side of China, went over North Korea, and we lost it as it went into Japan. Almost about two-thirds of the way around the planet, um, but we're going to try again. Um, and uh, that's going to be probably... Uh, we're still going to be in orbit with Lab 8, and we're going to take a little – we'll probably have just completed the mission. Now we're going to be stowed. We'll put some fixative to fix the plant, and we'll wait for its return, and we're going to do this balloon launch probably around April. Um, and that's a dollar a student to get a seat wow. on that balloon ride. Again, right. magnitude, right? How do we get more students engaged in exploration uh, in, uh, of the extraordinary, in this case, atmospheric research versus the – orbital astrobotany research we're doing right now. And there's other cool things that are coming up, but I don't want to overwhelm. I think our right. big opportunity right now is with about 60 days 
less than 60 days, um, is getting uh, those that would like to join us for Excellent. I see if we can get you right under the wire here and get some kits out to you. Maybe, Jay, uh, it would be good for you and Tony to um, maybe connect and think about as a central resource. If they order through you, we can send one nice big package, right, as opposed to a bunch of little packages. Uh, and then you can act as the really as the center to this, the spoke in the wheel, right? Uh, the hub in the in the in the wheel. Um, and uh, so we're really excited about that. Um, but the lab experiment, uh, again, for the lab, if you want one at your home or your classroom or whatever, it's just three hundred ninety nine US, right? I guess shipping we'll have to figure out in the taxing what whatever. But that will get you to connect to the space station, and you'll get live data that classroom environment Tony shared. And then for students that would like to join in and just do this at home, uh, then it's a, a, the kit is a $10 kit. And it's that little, it has the seed packs in it and the inoculum and a magnifying glass, a pipette and some gloves. And they can, uh, what we call upcycling, right? Is that what we're calling it? We go find a water bottle or maybe like a container that's clear at home that you can pour your agar in and grow your plants and then do your own monitoring. Maybe take a, uh, uh, Mr. Wilkinson advice there and do a little sketch, you know, in addition to trying to quantify what you're saying, can you can you visualize it using colors or what have you? So there's a lot of ways to engage simple at home without the Exolab, $10 a student. If you want to get the, the laboratory itself and connecting, and then you can run other experiments if you'd like beyond that, uh, it's $399. Uh, and the platform license takes you through, I think through June 30th under this pricing model. And if you right. want to join us on the next mission, Exolab 9, and when it comes up, then there's additional cost for the materials to go in it. But you don't need to buy another Exolab because you already got one, right? Right, right. Okay. And and um, I, I guess from Malaysia currently right now, teachers are all on holidays right up to 20th of January. Uh, so hopefully uh, there are those who are, are watching right now. Uh, you, you may be able to, you know, take this, uh, have a look at it. And probably at, at, at the start of the semester, you'll be able to participate it at the start of the semester from there as well. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's the same situation in, in the US. Uh, currently right now, COVID uh, has just spiked up in Malaysia. So mm -hmm. schools are currently closed down. Uh, however, we, we hope that schools uh, will be reopened uh, very soon uh, uh, after January. That's, that's the uh, intended uh, target uh, that we're actually having right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our schools will be open, uh, but I think most will be done in this kind of distance learning environment. Right, right. right. Um, but they will be, the class will be in session. You'll just be in your PJs there in your living room or whatever, right, uh, taking classes um, if they let you do that. Right, right. So. And and uh, I guess uh, we, we have actually posted the link down there. So for those of you who are watching and will be watching later on as well, uh, please do click, click in on uh, both of these links over here to find out more details on it. And uh, please do uh, email us and also uh, the team from Magnitude IO if you have any inquiries on this project, how your school can participate in this, how you as a parent as well uh, can take charge of this uh, program uh, with your kids at home, especially during COVID as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and for towards that, uh, Ted, Tony, Michael, and Laurie, would you be able to share with us as well uh, in, in final thoughts uh, on the, the future of Magnitude IO, uh, the, the sort of like the vision and on, on how you're trying to build uh, education in a, more of a fun way, would you be able to share with us the vision on uh, where Magnitude IO is uh, progressing uh, towards for the next few years to come? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we don't want to eat up another hour of your time. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you know, the idea I think first and foremost is to understand that we can do fundamental learning, the sciences, mathematics, language art, whatever it is, and we can do it right at the very edge of human discovery, right? Uh, we don't need to wait for that. So them, number one, so anything you see coming from us beyond Exolab 8, it's gonna be pushing right to the very envelope of human endeavor. It's fascinating. Uh, and we can take it at a very simple level and we can deeply go complex. And when we start getting those complexities, that's when we reach out to our university partners. You know, Jay, if you're working with universities there in Malaysia, we should probably connect and think about what we can do at that level as well. Career pathways. Um, amazing thing about space is it really kind of was born in the, in the 50s and 60s and in the 70s. And a lot of those engineers are retired or they've passed away, they're old. What's the next generation gonna come up? And you know, the generation that's coming up right now, you're 10, 12, 15, 18 years of age, you've got a little different perspective on the world, don't you? Versus right. all these kind of gray hairs that think that they know what they're doing. 
you can show us the way you see the world and that influence can help us make a better planet. And so we're really listening and, and, and we want to help any way we can. So future missions, we surface to the moon. Uh, I think we can do it this decade. Um, I like to tell people, I just need to 10 kilograms, right? There's some big challenges on the moon without going too far in depth. You've got constant heat and from the sun for like two weeks. And then you're in utter darkness for like two weeks. So like plus 200 C minus 200 C. So you got to survive that. You need power somehow. Usually it's solar. They're not, I don't think they're going to let us run any kind of radio isotope. Uh, and then it's got to communicate. Uh, beyond that, what's the actual experiment? Well, you can see that we really love plants and bacteria. So more than likely it would probably move down that path. Um, there's something amazing that's happening right now. Uh, the space station was an international enterprise of countries. And what was just installed uh, within the last week or two was an airlock that was fully commercial. It was private party. It's basically a big bell jar they've attached to the side of the space station through a company called Nanorax. And that's the first step to true commercialization of this orbital platform called the International Space Station. There's a company called Axiom that's coming up right now with the first module. There'll be a fully commercial module uh, that will be attached to that as a prototype for something called the Gateway or the uh, the Lunar Gateway, which is a, a space station in lunar orbit uh, and it will act as a way station for, uh, for uh, expeditions to the lunar surface but also as a staging area to go deep space on that, on that Martian rendezvous. You know, we're talking about those, that home and transfer, 26 month transfer. One sixth gravity on the moon, a lot less energy required to move it from that orbit to the moon, right? Um, and so that means you can send a lot more payload. So look at that all coming within the next dozen years. And so if you're 12 right now, you'll be just getting out of college. And uh, the, the train schedule will be running. You know, they'll be having ships going to Mars and uh, they'll be putting something in on the lunar surface. They're looking for water, ice and other things like that. Will we find life on other planets? I don't know, but whatever research we do, I think uh, something I think Tony and I are very passionate about. We're both parents, you know, um, kind of starting this, if anything, for the love of learning for our own children. My children are men now, <laughs> they're 23 and 25, but. Um, it's how do we make life better here on Earth also. So uh, let's tap the intelligence of all of the young people, wherever they might be on the planet, and let's find ways to solve the problems together, not in competition, but in cooperation, because I think that's really how we're going to solve some of the biggest problems. The competition is good uh, to find kind of identify uh, leaders, but for overall engagement, we're really looking for the cooperative nature of the opportunity. So that's all I want to say. And I imagine Tony, Lori, Michael, you got a little a moment, uh, something you want to share with us as well. I mean, there's two thoughts that keep, keep driving me is that, that those, those 10, 12, 14 year olds, most of them, the first job that they take doesn't even exist today. <laughs> so it's all about imagination. It's all about vision and risk. Um, and then the other thing that always, you know, if my Cubs can win the World Series, anything is possible. <laughs> so I think we can get back to the moon in my lifetime. All right. Go, go ahead, Laurie. Uh, I was just going to say for, for teachers, this has been such a different year with the pandemic, but it's also such an opportunity to take our practice as educators and really invigorate the project-based learning aspects that get kids excited about, they see, they see that why their learning makes a difference and they're, they're more engaged and they, they want to come to class because they want to share what's happened with their plan or um, ask questions about why something's not going well. Um, it's real world learning and it's authentic research and it's just such a, a different direction than um, what we've done in the past in classrooms with textbooks and work worksheets. And so pandemic learning doesn't have to just take us back to the, the old normal after we, we get a vaccine, but let's do a new normal um, mm -hmm. and connect kids around the world um, and show them what is possible. 
um, beyond their wildest dreams and to dare mighty things. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge opportunity for them uh, to connect with us and, and accomplish that. I'm ready to go, Lori. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Tony, you want to send us out? Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I, I wanted to end uh, with this. Um, I have had a student asking me this uh, before, you know, after uh, our presentation. And uh, one, one have said, um, what if I don't want to go to space? And it's perfectly fine. You know, uh, what we're learning today um, they don't have to become an astronaut, right? In the future, they can become um, the engineer that build that spacecraft for the astronaut to go up, right? Uh, they can be the, the food engineers, you know, making sure all the astronauts are getting all the nutrition and also being fed um, um, properly. So, oh, and, and also another one was that, um, um, uh, you know, the, there there's a lot of opportunity within this uh, whole experiment that um, uh, they can really work. I mean, that the student at home, they can really work with um, uh, their parents. Uh, quite often in the past, when we have an experiment on the station, one one student said, okay, I'm going on, a, um, on vacation this uh, weekend. Uh, going to Tahoe to go skiing, uh, but every morning, what what the student did was that uh, he logged onto his own account with his parents to look at the plane in space, and the parents was was so excited doing that with them, and and uh, that that kind of um, um, opportunity for them to really work together and um, creating another uh, conversation piece with their parents is wonderful. Right. Yeah. And, and I guess very well said. Uh, so uh, for final call out uh, to, to those watching right now and will be watching later on as well. So the, the next uh, uh, Exolet uh, launching of the, the rocket to space will be on uh, February 20th. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. So so that'll be the date. So uh, some. Uh, so when, when will be the closing date of uh, submission uh, from from everyone over here? Mm. It, it, technically, we're supposed to be closing it at the end of this year. Um, oh, but right. we're doing this session now. Um, I think Jay maybe coordinate something with Tony. We can work through it. I'm thinking mid January here is kind of late, but if we have one care package heading to Kuala Lumpur or whatever, we can probably do that. Uh, and you can always, as Tony's mentioned, you can, and I think Michael mentioned as well, you can always review an experiment after it's been up and running. We love the live experiment. If you can get as close to the launch date as possible, because we do these weekly telecons. I don't think we mentioned that. During the actual mission, we get everyone together like this. We have a chance to share ideas, frustrations, insights, uh, you know, just observations all together as one community. Um, so try to join us here if you think you can make a decision. I guess if you're if your school if you're a teacher and school isn't going to open until the 20th, you may be watching this a little late. Maybe we need to figure out something to get a care package out to UJ so you can have a standby some equipment if anyone wants to join us at the 11th hour. But we'd love you to join us. We have another mission coming up in 2022. Uh, I don't know if you want to wait that long, um, but uh, it isn't. It, we're not going to go away. We'll be around. Um, we also have a cool robot we'll be talking about next time. We have a chance to get together again. It's in space, and it's going to be operational in 2022 also. So you got to plan for this stuff. It takes a little while. But for now, I'd say, um, you know, please reach out to us. Hello at magnitude.io will reach all of us. And I... Uh oh, oh, we lost him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Jay, uh, you want to close this up? Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess uh, from towards that, uh, for for teachers, uh, parents, uh, it doesn't matter if you are uh, uh, from elementary, uh, junior high, senior high, all the way to university. Uh, everyone can have a, a say and, and a participation uh, in this uh, Exolab program. So uh, hopefully that uh, more of you are aware of uh, what Exolab is all about uh, and the uh, opportunities and the learning. Uh, 
uh, uh, channels that uh, Magnitude IO has. And I guess uh, from towards that, I, I would just like to uh, invite ev uh, everyone around here to uh, have uh, a concluding word uh, for those of you, uh, those of us who are watching over here on uh, Edu uh, on Edu Chat series. Uh, probably if we can start from Tony, any concluding words uh, on the entire experience uh, and what you actually hope for. Uh, for teachers that will be participating uh, in the future to come. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I was, yeah, yeah. I was uh, reading a message. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I really hope uh, to have uh, all of you uh, joining us, um, and and uh, science uh, without border um, uh, is uh, what we want to practice, and. Um, uh, um, Michael and Lori uh, would love um, um, to share what uh, what are stuff that is uh, happening to behind the scene, and uh, science can be can be really really exciting. So I hope uh, you all can uh, join us and um, and uh, learn together. All right, and uh, from Michael as well, a uh, final uh, shout out to uh, those who are watching uh, right now, teachers, parents from Malaysia and uh, across Southeast Asia as well. Yeah, please uh, join us, even if it's in a small way. Uh, just keep learning, take risks, um, and, and reach out to us with your ideas. Uh, we really, we hope to have you part of our, of our community. All right, and, uh, and I guess finally from Lori as well. <laughs> Come join us in Dare Mighty Things because it's going to be exciting over the next several decades in space. So it's so much to, to do and to learn and to be involved. All right. Awesome from that. And I guess uh, before we actually go, I uh, just wanted to find out from all of you uh, if there are any questions from uh, teachers and, and parents that are interested about this program, uh, what is the best uh, way to contact you? Uh, or is there an email address that we can uh, share with everyone uh, with regards to any inquiries? As, as Ted said, the hello at magnitude.io is the easiest thing right. to all of us. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll be sure to share this in from there. And I guess. Uh, uh, from uh, from Ted, uh, I guess he's experiencing some uh, difficulties in uh, communication, but that's all right uh, from there. And uh, with that, I guess uh, thank you so much, uh, Ted, uh, Tony, Michael, and Laurie for joining us on the you know on the second day of uh, Christmas. Uh, thank you for spending your time with us over here in Asia. Uh, we definitely look forward to have you uh, on board again on the Edu Chat uh, to share with us uh, on your future experience and experiments, especially the balloon. Uh, project uh, that is definitely something very interesting that uh, we're looking forward to yeah and I guess with that uh, thank you so much again for joining us uh, so uh, take care everyone we wish you Merry Christmas uh, Happy New Year uh, all right so Ted is back over here uh, just in time for the final shout out <laughs> to to all of those who are watching right now thank yeah, you Ted. Jay great opportunity to, to thank you Jay to talk to y'all Happy New Year everybody all right. So happy new year. And, and Ted, uh, any final uh, concluding words uh, from to it, uh, the CEO of Magnitude.io, uh, final shout out uh, to teachers and parents and those who are watching right now. Come join us with Jay in space for Excellent 8. Okay, so so I guess with that, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in, and uh, we, we hope to see you very soon uh, in uh, in our future programs and hopefully on the Excellent uh, projects together as well. Right. All right. Thanks, All right. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye, -bye. Jay, Take let's care. make it happen. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. So there you have it. The team from magnitude.io. Wow. Uh, it's um, so, so if uh, teachers who are just uh, tuning in right now, uh, so we are we are doing sort of like a shout out uh, to all teachers, parents. Uh, if it doesn't matter if you are from primary school, secondary school, all the way to university. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Magnitude IO is running an experiment or a project that will actually send one of their experiments. Uh, all the way to space orbit, so all the way to the International Space Station, so whereby uh, the specimen kit that is being sent over here, you will actually get access 
directly to monitoring the growth of the uh, experiment. So uh, I, I forgot what is the, the main thing that they'll be sending in, but they will be growing sort of like a, a growth of plant. And then what happens is that you would actually get to observe uh, the experiment right out on space, right? And then you get to monitor all of the different data, including humidity, uh, light, and, and the microgravity data, and, and sort of like a very interesting experiment for you and your students to be able to uh, experience uh, experiment uh, experimentation uh, on towards that. Right. Uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, they'll be sending a clover plant over in space orbit, and then you would get to uh, experiment and to be able to observe visually uh, you'll be provided with data on all of the different aspects of the growth of the clover plant and then um, you would be able to get access to all of the uh, learning materials that magnitude.io has prepared for you now why is this significant on that way uh, if i put it in a simple term there's not many chance that you are able to send something uh, all the way to space, right? Uh, including the micro uh, gravity, uh, gravity environment. It's not every day that you would get a chance to send something like this onto space and to be able to observe it on this magnitude of scale, right? So uh, definitely, uh, so we have shared the uh, email down over here. So if you have any questions uh, with regards to the uh, ExoLab project, as well as the magnitude.io programs here to come, please do email them at hello at magnitude.io to uh, find out more about this program. And I know that uh, schools are currently on holiday right now. So <laughs> we're opening on the 20th of January over in Malaysia. Uh, but do uh, take note on this uh, because this will be something very, very out of this world uh, that hopefully your students will be very engaged uh, in finding out more about this program over here. All right. So I guess uh, thank you everyone for tuning in on today's uh, Edu Chat series. I hope you enjoy uh, what has been shared by the team from uh, Magnitude.io. Definitely something very, very interesting, especially when it comes to the 21st century education. Uh, where you actually get to send something to space and to be able to observe all of the feedbacks uh, of your experiments from there, right? Definitely something very, very out of this world. Uh, never heard before in my terms uh, that uh, we hope that uh, more students and teachers are able to get involved in this project from here. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in on today's session. And if you love what you have uh, hear about today, uh, please uh, do share this link out uh, from the Malaysia Education Summit Facebook public page or uh, from our YouTube channel to any of the teachers uh, or any of your parents out there that might be interested in this program over here. All right. So I guess uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for joining in on this EduChat series for today. This would probably be the final one of 2020. And um, we look forward to our next uh, EduChat series next year. So with that, uh, Jay Wong over here, it has been an amazing journey going through all of the EduChat series uh, from the start of the year right away until now. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in into all of the different episodes uh, from uh, all the way from March all the way until now. It has been an amazing journey. Uh, and me, myself, I have learned tremendously from all of these different educators from around the world. And hopefully it has been the same with you watching at home as well. Uh, and with that, I would like to bid farewell uh, for 2020. Thank you so much. Uh, wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we will hope to see you next year in 2021 with something even more exciting, something even more uh uh, amusing and hopefully we'll be able to connect uh, in future as well take care everyone and with that uh, happy saturday and we'll see you next year 2021 at your chat series take care everyone goodbye and uh, hope you have a great year ahead take care